Hello, and welcome to the seventh session in our extended reality lecture series, where we cover the topic of lighting in real-time rendering, more precisely, the development of various geometry depiction techniques and approaches that govern the rendering process. So in our previous sessions, we have introduced this photorealism structure, and we have referenced this rendering pipeline from literature, where we have talked about materials or texture data as an important component of both the photorealism structure and the rendering pipeline. However, texture data is closely connected to the lighting and rasterization terms, which is when we have to explore the lighting within the rendering pipeline. To start this exploration, we can take a look at this example called Reflections, which is Star Wars themed tech demonstration of experimental graphics techniques for use in video games built with Unreal Engine 4. In this, we can see the terms real time as well as ray tracing in order to create this cinematic demo. Getting this cinematic 24 frames per second with real time ray tracing required some serious hardware. It was running on Nvidia's ultra high end 4 GPU DGX station, which was listed for $60,000 at the time. This fact made it clear that this approach was still not ready for consumer market, but gave notice to the potential that existed within the field. In order to explore this notion within the rendering pipeline, we can first turn to the rasterized part and explore what rasterization means. So in basic terms, rasterization is the process of taking a vector graphics image, which is made up of shapes and converting it into a raster image, which is made up of pixels. The first step in the rasterization process is to stitch together the vertices that are visible by the camera, which is to say that they are still present after the clipping process in order to create the triangles. In simple terms, it means that for a simple triangle or a geometry primitive within the scene, we introduce a camera which has a certain amount of pixels for capturing the image onto it. The vertices from the triangle are connected to the camera position, intersecting the image plane and creating intersection vertices on it. Once the triangle is generated on the image plane, the rasterization process is implemented with various algorithms to determine what pixels are included in the triangle depiction and what their color is. Rasterization is in use today with OpenGL and DirectX to depict the geometry fast. However, there is one problem that can occur with rasterization, which is visibility, which is to say, based on the rasterization approach, how do we know what is in front and what is behind when multiple primitives are in the scene? The solution for this requires additional calculations, which can be depicted as a grayscale image with varying pixel intensities called the Z buffer. The Z buffer is a type of data buffer used in computer graphics to represent depth information of objects in 3D space from a particular perspective. Depth buffers are an aid to rendering a scene to ensure that the correct polygons properly occlude other polygons. It is basically used to measure the distance between the image plane and the geometry. Even though this problem is solved, one major problem still remains for the rasterization application in real-time rendering, which are shadows, reflections and refractions, meaning all things that consider the light rays and not just the primitives and the texture data. In order to solve this issue, a concept of ray casting was introduced by Arthur Apple back in 1968. Now, instead of using the object centric approach, such as rasterization, Apple suggested using an image centric approach where based on the amount of pixels, the same amount of rays will be cast from the camera position. The ray and geometry intersection can be calculated easily, and what is more, the visibility issue is solved by observing the closest intersecting point between the ray and the geometry, diminishing the necessity of a Z buffer and calculating the appropriate pixel colors accordingly. This approach seemed promising, but also presented a major problem, which was the sheer amount of calculations that needed to be done. Given that this was introduced back in 1968, when computer graphics was still at its infancy, this concept seemed like science fiction, like Buck Rogers in the 25th century or Duck Dodgers in the 24th and a half century. If we take a simple example, we can try and understand the scope of the number. Imagine wanting to generate an image, which is a thousand by a thousand pixels in size and has the Utah teapot, which has around a thousand polygons. Using the ray casting process would require shooting 1 million rays which has to interact with around a thousand polygons, which can get close to 1 billion intersection calculations based on the position of the camera. Of course, some optimization techniques can be implemented to reduce 
computation, but the sheer amount of calculations is so vast that this concept required some time to be implemented following Moore's law. Moore's law states that the number of transistors on a microchip doubles every two years, which is why we can expect the speed and capability of our computers to increase every two years while we pay less for them. It is important to mention that Moore's law is an observation and projection of a historical trend and not an actual law of physics. This is an empirical relationship linked to gains from experience in production at an exponential growth. However, Moore's law may be approaching its natural death as close as the 2020s, which is perhaps most painfully present at the chip manufacturer's themselves. In 2012, a 22 nanometer processor was made, while today they are bringing the size close to 7 nanometers. For perspective, 1 nanometer is smaller than the wavelength of visible light. The diameter of an atom is about 0.1 to 0.5 nanometers. While the development of technology was underway for almost a decade, another paper appeared that was based on the concept of ray casting called ray tracing. In order to solve the issues of proper shadows, refractions, and reflections, in his paper, Turner Witted suggested an improved illumination model for shaded displays that functioned like this. So we shoot out the rays from the camera, implementing the ray casting approach. These rays are called the primary rays. However, when a primary ray hits a surface, another ray is drawn from the intersection point to the light source in order to verify whether the object light is illuminating this part of the geometry. If it is, then that pixel is colored by the diffuse and specular highlight colors based on the material information. However, if that part of the geometry is in shadow, it is assigned an ambient color. Furthermore, if the surface is reflective, the ray bounces off the geometry elsewhere in the scene based on the angle of incidence. If it encounters another geometry, the color of that pixel will be influenced by this reflection. Since we draw a lot of these secondary rays and the same procedure is repeated, this makes this procedure a recursive ray casting process. The procedure, of course, gets more complicated if the rays are refracted when we use the index of refraction to calculate the light direction after the intersection. So you can see that this whole procedure requires a lot more calculations than the simple ray casting process called for. For example, this is Turner's first rendered image, which was 512 by 512, that included shadows, reflections, and refractions. And it took them 74 minutes to render this in 1980. Following the Moore's law, that would mean that in 1982, it would take them only 37 minutes to render. In 1984, only 18 and a half minutes to render. In 1990s, only 2.3 minutes. And at the end of the millennium, only 4.3 seconds to render. However, when talking about real-time rendering, we have to render multiple images in less than a second, which is why the possibilities for realistic real-time rendering became prominent in 2016, when it only took 16 milliseconds to render, allowing for 60 frames per second of refresh rate. But as we've said, this trend seems to have lost its exponential growth due to physical limitations of building circuits out of substance made out of atoms, which is why we cannot rely on these times increasing in the future at that rate. So with all these approaches, we were mostly focusing on the best way to calculate the direct illumination. So what happens when a surface is illuminated by light directly? However, we have to take into account how the light scatters as it's hitting the geometry in the scene which is when we include the indirect illumination. So we need both direct and indirect illumination in order to light up the scene properly. And in order to calculate it all appropriately, we have to talk about the rendering equation, which was introduced in 1986's paper of the same name by James Kajia. So the rendering equation looks like this, taking into consideration the conservation of energy and Maxwell's equations to properly simulate the light behavior. At first, it may look intimidating trying to understand how to calculate something with this amount of variables and with included integrals. In this lecture, we will focus on the important factors and concepts, skipping the actual calculation process. We can also take out the T variable and the wavelength to make the process more straightforward. So the first part specifies that the amount of radiance or the total amount of light of a pixel following a primary ray omega cast from the camera to a specific location x is equal to the amount of emitted radiance at that point, which is non-zero for light sources, and the integral of the BRDF, which we talked about in our previous session, basically having an array of secondary rays being bounced off in a normal oriented half sphere with omega i denoting the direction of the incoming light. 
So now that we understand the important factors of the rendering equation, we can take a look at this image and discuss whether we consider it to be realistic enough. You can pause the video and discuss it in the comments which aspects you consider to be unrealistic for you. Similar analysis can be conducted for this image as well, evaluating all the photorealism principles we've introduced thus far and figuring out if something is off. For example, the chaos concept can be more emphasized with scratches and imperfections showing. Now, the latter is an architectural visualization shown here as a clay render, while the first image was a real photograph. If you think you saw something in it, it was only due to the expectations that you need to find something instead of something actually being there. Now, even though the rendering equation solved the issue of both direct and indirect lighting, it still presented the old problem, which was the amount of calculations. Only six years prior, upon the introduction of ray tracing, the amount of calculations seemed to require a certain amount of time. By the time of rendering equation introduction, however, that amount of calculation would be done around 10 times faster. However, the computation time remained more or less the same. This is called the Blin's Law which basically states that the rendering time tends to remain constant even as computers get faster. 3D artists prefer to improve quality, rendering more complex scenes with more sophisticated algorithms, rather than using less time to do the same work as before. Now, the solution for the large amount of calculations, as we can see nowadays, is not to wait for computers to get faster, but to reduce the amount of calculations to decrease the rendering time, which is when we introduce the concept of Pre-processing. So pre-processing basically means that we do the calculations and bake or store that information for the real-time rendering process to be used at appropriate times. By doing some of the calculations up front, we save time during the actual rendering process. And one approach is radiosity, which only accounts for paths which leave a light source and are reflected diffusely some number of times before hitting the eye, taking information from other surfaces reflecting light. Radiosity is viewport independent, which increases the calculations involved. As the algorithm iterates, a light can be seen to flow into the scene as multiple bounces are computed. Individual patches are visible as squares on the walls and floor. So radiosity-based methods are generally not used to solve the complete rendering equation. But since the rendering equation takes long to compute, we can make some approximations and reduce the rendering time in such a way. One method of doing this is the DMC or the deterministic Monte Carlo integration, which represents a broad class of computational algorithms that rely on repeated random sampling to obtain numerical results. The underlying concept is to use randomness to solve problems that might be deterministic in principle. Basically, it is a probabilistic method of approximation where the integral in the rendering equation is solved by averaging a large number of random values which is the case when shooting off secondary rays in various directions and procuring the lighting scatter information. With a small amount of samples, the end result is noisy. However, by implementing importance sampling, the scattered light rays are more focused towards the light source, expecting the light data to derive from shooting rays in this direction more than in other directions. The comparison shows less noise when using this approach type. Monte Carlo integration is even a part of the path tracing algorithm, which is showcased by Disney in this video, going into detail as to how the realistic light behavior and material depictions are acquired. So knowing the terminology related to the rendering process, we can have a more profound understanding of this real-time ray tracing example. Having insight into the underlying rendering principles, as well as the driving forces that govern them, we can decide what the best approach for a specific project is based on the rendering time and computational power. In the next video, we can take a look at a couple of guidelines for determining the proper lighting within a real-time rendering scene, focusing on the exposure and materials, so be sure to check it out. I thank you for your time, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.